morning, everyone, and good afternoon to Mr. Garrett, who's joining us live today from England. Welcome to our last webinar of the year. Today, we welcome Fergus Garrett, who will cover the biodiversity audit that was done at the Great Dixter House and Garden. This presentation continues our dialogue on the important role we all play in creating and maintaining landscapes that serve as functioning beneficial habitats. Special thank you to Ann Cicerella for sponsoring today's program. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium. She is dedicated to building connections and inspiring conversations about the need to restore our fragmented native habitats, starting with our own backyards and local community plots of land. She's instrumental in the planning of our annual symposium, Inviting Biodiversity into Our Gardens, which has attracted thousands of views on our YouTube channel. I'm pleased to announce that Anne, Judy Semrock, and myself are thoughtfully planning the 2024 Biodiversity Symposium, which will kick off in January. Stay tuned for details. I'm Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. I plan nature-based nature experiences year-long to help the public gain a greater appreciation of our natural world. I am especially fond of programs such as today's, because it builds awareness on topics that affect our environment and the communities in which we live, allowing us all to be better stewards in protecting and preserving our natural resources. During today's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. It is my pleasure to introduce Fergus Garrett. Fergus has held the position of head gardener at the internationally acclaimed Great Dexter Garden in the United Kingdom since 1993. Great Dixter is the family home of gardener and gardening, gardening writer Christopher Lloyd. Fergus learned to keep the gardens of Great Dixter constantly changing throughout the seasons and to be adventurous in trying out new plants and plant combinations directly from Mr. Lloyd, who founded the Great Dixter Charitable Trust in 2003. Following the passing of Mr. Lloyd in 2006, Fergus took over the position of its CEO. Thanks to the friends of Great Dixter and their continuous support, the trust is able to keep the home and garden open to the public, to develop educational programs for all ages, and to make more and more people aware of the richness and importance of the biodiversity of Great Dixter's gardens, meadows, and woodland. In addition to his role as CEO and head gardener of Great Dixter, Fergus is spearheading several projects, including the greening up of urban and suburban communities, biodiversity-related projects in towns and villages, and training students from all over the world in the Dixter style of flower gardening. His many hobbies and interests include looking at plants and plant communities in the wild, geology, rocks, baskets, the sea and fish, cooking, boxing, rural crafts, and meeting nice people. Fergus, it's my pleasure to virtually welcome you on behalf of the nice people of Northeast Ohio. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, for joining me this morning. Um, and um, it's really an honor to be <coughs> speaking to your organization. And I know you do a lot of good work, which I was sort of following, looking up um, prior to this lecture. So it's really great. I, th I want to come at this as a, as a gardener because I, I went to study um, horticulture at university and um, and. You know, that was all to do with pest management, um, taxonomy, botany, all those sort of things. But we never, ever studied any sort of ecological side of things. This was way back in the 80s. And thank goodness things have changed. But I gardened at Dixter, as, as, as Rene said, from 1993. And we gardened it in a very sympathetic way, but we never ever sort of opened up our minds to um, the insects and all of the, the microcosm of life that share this land with us. So I'm gonna tell you the story of how this biodiversity audit um, developed and, and what it led to as, as well. So you can see from this picture, this is a picture of the, the topiary garden that's Dexter, the peacock topiary. And you can see that we're wildish. You know, we've got some amazing giant fennels here that are just punch, punching the sky. We've got lots of Queen Anne's lace and poppies and lots of stuff. So, so we've got a wildish look about us. And um, the garden is over a hundred years old. It was first put together by Christopher's parents, Nathaniel and Daisy Lloyd with that extraordinary architect, um, Sir Edwin Lutchens. 
And um, so it's very nice. It's got a very nice settled feel about it. It's got the old lime mortar is, has crumbled in the walls, so things grow out of the walls. Um, it's got plants that spill out onto the paths as well. It's got very nice patterns of lichen on the stonework, and it's got a very rich seed bank. So when you open up the soil, there's everything from poppies to, to um, Miss Wilmot's ghost, to alliums, to red oryx, teasels, fennels, all of those things that erupt out of the soil. Of course, weeds germinate as well. But so so we have this very sort of free flowing uh, look about us. us. And, um, and we're extremely dynamic. You know, this is a picture of a, of a seat in, in the winter or just in the spring, actually, as we come out of the winter with primroses flowering and that same seat just a few weeks later um does that as it as it all the other vegetation comes up and 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 covers it so you can see how how free we are with vegetation that's self-sowing and you can see that on a dry stone wall the back drive which leads down to our kitchen yard um here with euphorbias and primroses and obrisha and that same wall five weeks later does that you know as as the the daisies <laughs> come and take over all of the other things that are in there. So we do a lot with self-sowers. You can see the garden is very dynamic. It's very loose. Um, so here is another um, another wall. See how wild it looks there? And that wall changes to that, you know, and then it changes to that as the vegetation develops. And as we go from, we go in here from spring right the way into summer, into autumn. And so the garden is, is colorful. Um, it's got a formal structure. It's within the countryside. It's in the it's in the county of East Sussex, um, in the village of Northiam, which is about fifty five miles southeast of London. And so we're on clay soil. We're near the coast as well. We're about ten miles from the coast. So it's it's an English country garden. Um, but you can see how much energy there is in this space, and energy is important. And it's, it's extraordinarily atmospheric and beautiful. You know, you can see in this photograph the countryside just beyond with the, you know, the, the, the oak trees and so on in the countryside beyond. And you see the formal gardens here with strong lines and yew hedges and with the topiary pieces. But look at the informality of all the self sellers that are there. And from ground level, you can see, you know, how it's, it's got a very interesting juxtaposition of the formal and the informal together. So we're a wildish garden. We have wildflower meadows, long grass areas that come into the garden, and they're just a cacophony of, of noise, you know, of, of all the crickets and grasshoppers and all of those things that are just chirping away, and the grass moves and sways and it changes, and, and the vegetation changes as well. So we've, we're surrounded by meadows, which are very important, and those meadows are dripping with all sorts of plants that have been lost in the countryside around us. You know, Dixter is very special in that within the garden and in one, one or two of our fields, we've got remnants of 400, 500 year old vegetation that would have been there. So it's a snapshot of time. And all of that's been lost as a result of intensive agriculture and change of land use. So it's, we're very happy to have that. And again, you know, it's a strange juxtaposition to have these long grass areas amongst the topiary pieces in the meadows. And you can see the distance in the distance there's the house itself so we're wild our walls are wild as well you can see the valerian and the mexican daisies coming out of the walls and then if you're going up onto the private terrace which is christopher's private terrace you'll see that you're walking amongst these mexican daisies the mexican fleabane and then you go onto the terrace in the winter it looks like this you know we're just coming out of the winter with primroses starting to flower and then it suddenly erupts into that you know, and then from there it changes again in, into that. And now I fully understand that that isn't at, to everyone's taste, um, but it was exactly what Mr. Lloyd wanted in this garden. He wanted to be amongst all these flowers, some wild, some some garden flowers all together. So to have this sort of real mixture that he sat amongst so he could watch the bees and the butterflies and enjoy the flowers themselves. So the garden is very, very dynamic like that. And it's got that soft edge of self-sowers, of, of elder planting softened um, with, with these elements that come into it. So this is a nursery stock bed where we have our mother plants for the nursery. And you can see from this picture, again, there's a loose element running through it. But that same area, just a few weeks later, will do that. OK, so, you know, so there's layer after layer after layer of vegetation in, the, in this in this garden. So a early summer shot here, this is taken in June, and that same area is that 
later on at the end of July uh, into August. You can see how, how colorful it is, okay? And, and a lot of that is as a result of this sort of layered planting that we do, this sort of, this, this which mimics what happens in the, in the wild around us. You know, our woodlands have got several layers of vegetation that come up, whether it's wooden enemies first and bluebells later, or bluebells first, wooden enemies later, and then the foxgloves and ferns, and then the canopy closes in over the top. It's, it also mimic what happens in our grassland, in our meadow areas, where you've got the early forbs that come up, later on replaced by the later forbs like meadow cranesbills and those sort of things and then later on replaced by the grasses so if you look at this patch of land snowdrops and crocuses that same area later on does that the snowdrops and crocuses are underground and then when that pink flower finishes the green leaves that you see at the base take over and that's what happens in the same area. So it's three plants sharing the same space. They've been like that for 30 odd years doing that one, one year after another. So it's, it's got a sort of real significance in public realm planting, but you can see that every inch of the soil works and it's, it's not only a habitat, but it's a source of pollen and nectar over a long season, which is very important. So snowdrops first, and then um, that's the same area later on in the season. Um, with ladybird poppies and alliums and those sort of things. Okay, and the snowdrops are dormant underground. So somewhere like the famous long border at Dixter, and incidentally, I'm sitting in the in this part of the building now in this room, which is a 15th century hall hall house that's been added onto the back of the um, Lutchen's wing. So I'm right in the in the middle there. You can see if I lift this up, you can see that it's, you know, it's an immense, extraordinary um, building. Um, so it's so here's the long border in, in early summer. Here it is in midsummer. Here it is in, in the autumn. And that's it in the winter. You can see color right through those sort of months and different vegetation. And I'm not saying we, we dig out stuff and put new stuff in. There's a little element of that, but I suppose only 10th of the border is treated like that. The rest of it is just one lot finishes and the other one pushes up through and takes over. Time. So it's very sort of clever planting that gives that border a long season. And it just mimics what happens in our grassland. Crocuses first, and then the, um, the snake said fitzillaries come next. And then the orchids take over and then the grasses take over from that. It's just the same principles. As, as, as that. So really long season, but also we're extremely floriferous and extremely colorful, you know, and we, we, we do everything from bedding out plants to having permanent displays that are underplanted with bulbs. We've got flowering shrubs, we've got trees, we've got the whole lot in, in together. So this, this sort of this collage tells you how colorful Dixter is. So, you know, that's a corner of, of the garden and that's another corner of the, of, of, of the garden. And that's another corner. You can see, you know, tulips with amongst foxgloves, tulips flower first, foxgloves take over. Okay. And then when the foxgloves finish, this is the bedding that follows over around from that. These are our bedding areas where we actually change the vegetation. And I suppose, again, that's only about a tenth of Dixter, but you can see how colorful it is and how long a season it gives us. So another part of the bedding area. And then it changes to that. So it's Hatsasakura tulips with forget-me-nots, followed by um, snapdragons, antirhinums, followed by dahlias and salvias and original nanias. So you've got three-tier display there. Another display with Persian lilac on one side, with cow pasty, blue amabla tulips, forget-me-nots, not, forget and that acid lime green smyrnium perfoliatum. And then it changes to that. And from that, it changes to that. You know, and so it goes on. You can see how dynamic it is, you know, from, from forget-me-nots and tulips to that with silenes and tanacetums and cyanoglossum and rudolphia, all sorts of things we've grown from seed to that zinnias that are late sown that will flower until, until November for us. And so you can see the gar garden is extremely colorful. And for some people, for some people, and this is important, some people it's extremely artificial because it's heavily gardened by us. Okay, and that's an important point to make. But you see, from our point of view, it's dynamic. You know, barn garden, this is an area that we're working on today. And then it goes to that in midsummer. Then it goes to that in late summer. Then it get, does that in the autumn. Same area. See how much of a food source there is for all those little insects here. 
And, and as well as that, as well as all that color, we've got a subtropical garden, which uses all of these sort of leaves to give you an effect like this. And then you step into there and, and you sort of, you, you take into another 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 world as you walk around there, and then you step out and you, of, of, of this sort of jungle, if you like, you step out into the long grass areas, and there may be non-native irises planted in the long grass area, in the meadow areas within, within the garden. Now, we've done that for years where we used all sorts of plants within our meadow areas. We never, ever plant anything that's non-native outside of the garden gate. You know that's that's treated in a completely different different way. Um, but within the garden gate, we're just playing with all sorts of plants. Okay, and so you've got smoke bushes and topiary pieces coming out of of long grass. So it's charming. It's utterly charming and interesting looking. So, so you can so that gives you a flavour of Dixter. So you can see that Dixter is a sensitively but highly managed flower garden open to the public. We're colourful, dynamic. We're dramatic. We're full of non-native plants, and we're garden. And so gardens like us are sometimes labelled as being unnatural and all things bad associated with old fashioned gardening, you know. And so um, when we're talking about doing a biodiversity audit, everyone, you know, ecologists especially, expected the wildlife value at Great Dixter to be low compared to the countryside beyond because it was so garden. You can see how inverted commas artificial we are with all those plants, it's full of colour, full of dahlias and cannas and begonias, which are hardly um, British natives. So Christo died, um, he was known as Christo to his friends. Christo died in 2006 after setting up the Great Dixter Charitable Trust. And we sort of guessed that the estate was already rich in biodiversity because of the, the ancient woodlands and the meadows and the pasture land and, and that sort of consistency of old fashioned management. Um, but in, and also in the garden, it was interesting because we historically, we sprayed herbicide and pesticide for weeds in the, in the garden. And we soil sterilized certain areas, you know, using sort of nasty chemicals. This is way back in the early 90s. And we tidied all the corners, you know, but gradually we sort of started to shed that. We were wildish, you can see from the meadows, that we're wildish, but, um, and we allow a lot of self sowers and things like that. Um, but we didn't really analyze what was happening. We enjoyed <clears throat> seeing the badgers and butterflies and bees and slow worms and grass snakes and woodpeckers and all those sort of things. <clears throat> but when there was no analysis. We were sensitive, but not proactive in any way. Okay. So these are the sort of things that we will see. <clears throat> so here you can see a great crested new and you can see badgers here and you know, the giant orb spider and, and a woodpecker, and there's lots of butterflies on that, Escalonia, and of course, all the orchids and so on. So, you know, we, were, we would always pat ourselves on the backs to say that Dexter is a quite a wild, you know, it's wildlife friendly garden, even though we're using all those chemicals and so on. But when Christo died in 2006, and we took a year, year or two to settle down, but I wanted to take things slightly further, you know, so we stopped spraying. Um, it, and we sort of gradually phased it out. Um, and we used organic fertilizer instead of inorganic. We used less fertilizer. Um, we stopped using peat. Um, we watered less. We developed more sealed units. By sealed units, I mean vegetation that follows one after another so that you don't have to do anything to it. It's just sort of multi-layered units. Um, we bedded out less. And that was a labor thing. You know, I was worried about whether we could keep the place going. And we allowed the outside edges to grow, encouraging vegetation to blow out. So the place became really charming. Um, but there were people who sort of raised a few eyebrows because people were doubting what we were doing. And, and it was very interesting because Dexter looked like this. It's just it's lovely sort of elements of the countryside around the outside edges of the garden, not in the garden, but we're doing this in the outside edges of the garden. And these are the car parks. You know, imagine how charming that is to actually go and sit on those picnic benches and have your tea or coffee in those car park areas. So, it's, you know, um, it became charming, but people were thinking, what on earth is going on? It's going a bit, getting a bit wild. But I must say again that we didn't change anything in the garden. The garden just went on in the same way in Christopher's way. Okay. But I then started making one or two changes to the garden. And they were just they were rather small changes, but they were changes nonetheless. I um, introduced cow parsley, which is a wild plant. It's this is Queen Anne's lace into the garden. 
just for not for biodiversity, but just for the look of it. And that raised a few eyebrows, you know, and look, it just looks absolutely charming. It's of the countryside. It's about bringing the countryside into the whole place um, when you have this plant. But, you know, even the great Beth Chatto phoned me up and said, what, what are you doing bringing cow parsley into the garden? It's a weed, you know. And, and I thought, well, it's, it may be a weed, but it's actually a rather gorgeous looking weed and I want to use it. And as long as I can control it and stop it self-sowing, why not use it? So I started doing that. And whilst I was doing all of that, my wife, who's an ecologist, who um, uh, saw the changes we were making to the countryside, and they were aesthetic changes. They weren't for biodiversity. She said to me, why don't you get a proper audit done, darling? She said, because she may not have used the word darling, but you know what I mean. She said, why don't you get an audit done? Because you can know what you've got and you can manage accordingly. And I didn't even know what she meant at that point, you know, so I just completely ignored her and went on. And, and I started playing around with introducing, you know, creating more meadows. Um, uh, I, partly because 98% of species rich meadows have been lost in this country since the Second World War. So if you wanted to do a bit of good, it was, it was you know, always, you were always, you know, pointed towards uh, creating another meadow, create another meadow, create another meadow, or introduce honeybees, have a few honeybees and a meadow and job done. You know, you've done your bit for, for wildlife. Um, I mean, later on, we realized that actually honeybees weren't the things that we needed here because they were actually quite aggressive. They squeeze out some of the native solitary bees and the mining bees that we've got. And also, um, they're, they're not good for, um, uh, I mean, they're non-native for a start and they're aggressive and and um, disruptive to plant pollinator networks, you know, so all of that. But anyway, we were just playing around with things. And so I introduced, started creating meadows and I introduced honeybees, as you can see there. And we had to put a cover around them because the badgers used to come and dig out the honey, honey, you know, knock this over and, and get at the honey. So we had to protect it. And so we started creating a few meadows around in the fields, around the garden as well, by using the hay from other parts of the garden, started doing that. And, and my wife has said, get a proper audit done because you don't really know what you're doing. Why are you creating another meadow? Why are you introducing honeybees? You know, do you know exactly why you're doing that? So again, I completely ignored her and I, I sort of started to, um, I invited groups like um, Butterfly Conservation to come and do a survey on our woods. They were surveying all the woods around us um, because the woods around us are quite special in that they're, they're coppice woods, which means that they're cut on a regular basis and they regen naturally regenerate. So you get this very nice mosaic system in them, sort of these sort of different age woods with scrub and so on. So you get this diversity of, of habitats. And so it's great for biodiversity. So they came and did a, um, a, a study and they realized that, that, that the whole of the woods in our area weren't being cut enough. So they'd become sort of quite shaded and so not good for insects at all. So, so I then decided to actually cut the woods a bit more. So I employed a couple of kids in the barn to make these hurdles and charcoal and to make, you know, to make them pay them for themselves so that we can then use, cut the wood and have a purpose for using the wood and we can sell all the stuff to pay for all the labor, etc. So, you know, it went down this route of doing all of that, which was, which was lovely. And so the woods were getting coppiced on a regular basis. And this is a photograph of our woods at Bluebell time you can see what a magical place it is and so you would take these multi-stem trees right down to the ground okay and then within 40 years they'd be up and, and grow like that okay so and what that does is that it, it creates a an area where you get um sunshine and light and warmth and an area um that's cold dark in this high forest area and all the other areas in between for instance nightingales like being on three to four year old scrub for instance and you can see this little drawing on the right hand side where we just did a sort of very brief plan of our woods where we'd have a, a say a chestnut coppice of um maybe 20 years cutting a section every year and so within by the time you finish in, tw in the 20th year you start on the th the, the bit that's um uh, that's 20 years old that you cut 20 years ago and so on so there's a rotation and so there was this sort of complex rotation that we were doing in our woods leaving some areas a high forest but maybe having a rotation of 40 40 50 years in some of the hornbeam areas and clearing the edges of around the ponds and also scalloping the woodland edges so that we have different amounts of light hitting the wood the floor as well so it's this sort of creation of this mosaic within our woodlands which actually helps with all sorts of things but really good for biodiversity 
And then I thought if the success in our woodlands was down to creating a mosaic habitat, with a, which creates a diversity of structures, then why not do the same with our grasslands, you know? And again, this was ad hoc because I didn't really know why we were doing it. So, and I'd come across this sort of cutting regime that Terry Wells had done all those years ago of, you know, different cutting regimes, whether it's a single autumn cut or a late cut in May or a spring meadow or a summer meadow or two to four cuts a year or a line for lawn for wildflowers, you know, a flowering hiccup, whatever, you know, all these sort of different cutting regimes. So I thought, well, I'm just going to try and cut the bits outside of the garden at different times and also graze some areas as well. So I I, I got um, a few lambs in and they, they grew to be sort of quite substantial sheep and they were grazing some areas. Some areas we were cutting on a regular basis and giving a completely different range of plants in. So here's a bellis lawn, bellis perennis lawn, and that relies on, with white clover, that relies on, on several cuts a year, whereas the long grass meadow areas are cut only twice a year, if not once a year. So I was doing all, all of that, and I bought myself a moth, moth trap and started setting the moth trap and started getting all these interesting moths, like elephant hawk moths and, and so on, hundreds and hundreds of different moths, you know, just quite striking looking things, as you can see with these hawk moths here and the cinnabar moth down there and so on. And really exciting things. And so I was patting myself on the back because suddenly we've got all these moths. But actually what it did is that inspired me in one way because these were all creatures that I wasn't aware of. Because, you know, they're nighttime creatures that we just completely ignored as gardeners. So so that was really quite interesting. And, and all the way along again, you know, my wife would say, every time I open my mouth about biodiversity or, or wildlife or moths or butterflies, she'd say, get a proper audit done you don't know what you're doing you know because you know if you know what's there you can manage accordingly you can manage for greater biodiversity or you can target a certain species but you now i tried not to ignore her then but i set up the biodiversity committee at dixter with um sarah who's my secretary there and there's my wife amanda you know um, who works at zsl you know and 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 so we started getting sort of people um look at bumblebees and got the swift man in and so on and so on and so on you know and um but it was again it was ad hoc you know but i just did it to keep them quiet and then just went went on but i decided you no know, about time i should take this seriously um so let's get some formality behind this so i wrote to the british arachnological society and it was really interesting because they were reluctant to come and survey the garden because we were a garden. They thought that um, we were going to be relatively sterile compared to, to the local re nature reserves around us. So I got a no from them. So what I did is I wrote to them again. And I said, we've got a 15th century manor house with a great, oh, you, I mean, I'm sure you must have an AGM. And why don't you hold your AGM at, at Dixter and you can have it, the building for free of charge and we'll give you sandwiches and drink and so on. You make you very comfortable. So they came and halfway through, the AGM when they wanted to take their break. Um, they had their lunch and then they wanted to get some fresh air in the garden. So they asked if they could go out into the garden, which I let them do. And they went out into the compost heap. And within 15, 15 minutes, they'd found 77 dif different species of spider on the compost heap. So they were really excited about that. Then they came along and walked down this path they opened that gate and just under that metal clasp there that i'm showing you here they found a jumping spider that's only found in three other places in the united kingdom then they walked down this path and there's a little watering point there they found a spider there that hadn't been recorded in sussex since the 1920s so they were rather excited by this and before i knew it the british arachnological society newsletter came to the door and there it was dexter was on the front page you know, front page of the news, let's say, with all the, you know, lists and lists and lists of spiders that they found at Dexter and no visit. So it was really quite exciting. And they even found a really interesting beetle that lived in the little sort of cracks in the wood here and lived in these sort of woodworm holes and the cracks. And they said, don't, don't, please don't, you know, touch that firewood. That was my own firewood. So you know, we went it cold for a winter. They said, don't touch that firewood because we want to see the life cycle of that beetle and what happens and so on and so on. So they were really, really exciting. And I thought, well, actually, that sort of gave me a bit of energy. And I always wanted to be like this man on the on the, on the the left. And I always wanted to create, you know, um, uh, these sort of... Uh, imitations of these Romanian haystacks. So 
Um, so what I did is I started making these habitat piles of just branches and wood and so on, and just making these big piles and putting them in grass areas and next to the mown areas, doing all of that. And you can see, you know, my wife was seething, thinking, what is he doing? He's not even done a biodiversity audit. What's he doing all of this? And then I come home and say, the woodpeckers are back and the swallows are back. And so on. I saw such and such a spider and we saw such and such a snake and so on. And she said to me, get a proper audit done. And say, she said, because, you know, there's this thing called the web of life, which is, you know, it has, you know, all of these things that are inter interdependent on each other. So you should really... You know, you should really try and pay attention to what's there at Dexter. So you've got a better idea of how to manage it. So what I did is that that I went with with Victoria Williams, who was, you know, working for us. And we went to London to the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is and they're a wonderful organization. And um, and they give money to all sorts of causes. And I said to them that I wanted to to do a biodiversity audit because I wanted to have a better ecological understanding of this incredible garden that's got a very good name and brand attached to it. But I just wanted to look at the insects that shared the space with us, and they were they were very positive about that. So they gave us a grant to get all the specialists in. So we had an archaeological assessment. We had did an invertebrate sub survey. We did a woodland vascular plant survey. We did lichens and butterflies and moths and hedgerows and, and algae and all of those sort of things um, in, the, in the ponds, all of those things that we have that, that, um, that are part of this place. You know, two wing flies and hoverflies flies and bees and and fly bees and, and and so on it was very complex and it took a year to do this survey and you got really interesting scientists on board you know people who really knew their stuff they're the top people in the country we paid for them to come and uh, you know so we got sort of simon davy who was really great on lichens coming to analyze the lichens at dixter found all sorts of interesting things all sorts of interesting things and, and he told me not to, to prune any of the branches off off, off the trees because they had, we had really interesting lichens in the orchard and then he told me about his car which had 27 different lichens on it then he had a, he had an accident and he hadn't washed his car for 40 years and it exposed a bit of metal and then he got another three lichens as a result of the accident and so on so you know fascinating fascinating people and and we've got extraordinary results that you can see here you know with 2300 species from a handful of visits you know over 110 species of lichen over 110 species of bee out of a total of 230 spe species there were seven nationally rare seven nationally scarce species there were 16 species of bumblebee out of 24 there were over 400 species of moth there were 32 species of butterfly and that's out of a total of 59 in the uk and over 250 species of spider out of a total of um 650 so over a third of the uk species in this little place in this little garden you know so we're incredibly incredibly rich and our ecologist said that numbers were going to go up as we survey more because they only surveyed a handful of times and rare species were easily found which means that they were common and our lead ecologist andy phillips said that great dixter was one of the richest sites he surveyed in 30 years and it changed the way he thinks about gardens. And at that point, he admitted that he was on the um, on the board of the British Arachnological Society. And when my letter was read out about them visiting Dixter, he was the first person to put his hand up to say, let's not go to a garden. And then now he's, he, he thinks that we should be called a garden nature reserve and we should be designated a, a local nature reserve or a local wildlife site, you know. So this was sort of quite unexpected within within the ecological community, um, where there can be a prejudice against a traditional garden like ours. You know, it's just very interesting, isn't it? But also, I must say, there's nothing new about this because um, this lady, Jennifer Owen, did this all those years ago in a suburban garden in Leicester. You know, she found two thousand six hundred um, and seventy three species in just seven hundred and fifty meters square. It's just extraordinary what she um you know what she found in in her little place. That I mean, was a thirty year study, but and she wasn't trying to create fake nature or anything like that. She she gardened, albeit it was slightly sort of sort of it's loose gardening like we do, but it was just riddled with 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 biodiversity. So why is Dixter rich? 
This series rich because it has a wide range of habitats from wet areas to dry areas to sunny to shady to mosaic woodland to mosaic grassland. It has bare ground, you know, so it's got sort of lots of lots of other elements to it. Porous buildings, fence posts, recycled material, porous walls. It's a complex and diverse mosaic. So there's a, a variety of habitats there. It has a long season of pollen and nectar, you know, layered planting over a long season, as you saw, you know, one lot of vegetation taken over from another. So, and, and it's not just natives, it's exotics and natives rubbing shoulders together. So there's a long season of food at Dixter. There's also, there's no spraying. There hasn't been any spraying for the last 14 years. So no chemicals used for that period. So there's that element of care. The trauma and disturbance was int interesting because they felt that that created another habitat. But the fact that we were digging the soil, lifting plants and so on, so that, that played a part too. So there was a diversity of practices in this place. The types of flowers were interesting. There were high populations of umbels and alliums, you know, so the, the carrot family and alliums because they are, they are great landing pads for a wide range of pollinators. Uh, and we grow a lot of species. So, so um, again, must say that nothing is chosen because it's a good, good for pollinators. We just grow a diversity of orna ornamental plants. Um, we don't look down our list and say, well, this is good for a pollinator. We, we look at something and say, do we like it or not? So, but, but it's a big enough garden. So we have a really diverse range of plants. Some are open for a wide range of insects to use. Others are very, very specific. So it's it's complex, So, but there is variety. And of course, the web feeds itself. The more there is, the more there will be. So that's important. And actually, Dr. Nigel Dunnett, who is a great sort of person, Professor Dr. Nigel Dunnett at Sheffield University, who's really done a lot of work on this sort of stuff, um, says that, interesting, because talk about creating mosaics and your actions and activities. Dexter is a highly creative place. And, and he calls it creative ecology. So we've taken this sort of this these sort of habitat formation, whatever, and been creative with it. And that's created an even more diverse mosaic. Okay. So we're 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 we work outside the norm, we're inquisitive and we experiment. And and of course, there's history to this place as well. There's years of activity. So is that, that that biodiversity is built up, built up. So an intensively managed garden with ecological practices can be a haven for wildlife. You know, Dixter proves this. Um, and Dixter is a large garden, but small gardens can add up to be something to be significant. And, and so can urban spaces, actually. Rooftops, parks, pavements, cracks, walls, they're all, all of this. And every space can play its part. You know, wildlife will and can adapt. And you don't need to rewild to do this. You know, you don't need to just let... just. I mean, if people want to rewild and just grow, um, just let Mother Nature take over, I've got no issues with that at all. You know, it can absolutely, you know, people, it's a free-for-all. People can do whatever they want. But if people want to grow cannas and dahlias and, so, and other plants, other ornamental plants, I think there's room for that as well. And I think, you know, so there's room for everything in this. So... Um, so a garden can blur the edges between horticulture and ecology, you see, you know, a garden like Dixter, uh, while still creating beautiful artistic spaces. Um, and also, I think we embrace some of our wild plants. And I think there's a whole community out there that don't embrace native plants in the UK. I think you're much better off much better in North America, but here they don't. They look at non-native, native plants as weeds. So, I, and so we, as a garden, a well-known garden, we're growing all sorts of weeds in our borders because um, cow parsley, buttercups, dandelions, those sort of things. And people seeing them here tend to embrace them a bit more, you know, so we can blur those edges and really make big inroads into, the, into this. Okay. And also, I think we we can be classed as woodland edge. You know, gardens in the UK are woodland edge. In, in, in the UK, we lost much of our integrated system of woodland merging into grass and two coexisting. The valuable ecotone of woodland edge, which is an extremely rich zone, has been tidied up and lost as we manage grasslands as grassland and woodlands as pure, pure woodland. Gardens serving as woodland edge have an enhanced diversity 
of flora and an enhanced diversity of structures and habitats. You know, you have that perfect storm. There's no reason this can't be replaced, replicated in towns and cities either. You know, you can create all those gardens can add up to something quite, quite interesting. You know, and I think it's in, in terms of towns and cities, you really need to give the power to the brave, bold and di um, diverse people, you know, and, and be dynamic with it because you can do amazing things. There's the opportunity is, is there. I think gardens serve a really important purpose because they, they capture a wider audience as well. And it's not always the converted audience as well. So that's really quite important um, with the work that we're doing. So we were looked on as a woodland edge by the ecologists, but we were also said that we mimic soft cliff habitat, you know, and it's, and so it was very interesting for us to see the garden through the ecologist's eyes, you know, some of these entomologists and ecologists, they, who weren't really into gardens, they saw it as a habitat that, that mimicked a certain habitat, you know, and they said that the fact that we, we have bare and porous paths adjacent to vegetation, which is constantly reworked, is this is an extremely valuable and dynamic habitat, which greatly enhances our biodiversity. You know, so they, so I see the borders and all the work we're doing in the borders and they saw that, you know, so it was, it was magic for us to actually be involved with these, with these, with this group really of, of just scholarly, wonderful um, people who were absolutely passionate about their subject. And there was two lots of people, different people met in the middle there in, in, at Dixler. And and it's powerful, isn't it? Because there's 433,000 hectares of garden in the UK. There are approximately 240,000 hectares of roadside verge in the UK. There's 1.7 million hectares of urban area in the UK, you know, and with 84% of the population urban. And all of that is out of the food production zone. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't push for sensitive farming as well, but actually we can make a huge difference in these these areas. And when you see Dexter like this, with its greenery coming in and so on, it's no different from the village that we're in. You can do the same thing in the village, and you can do, do the same thing in our largest town near us, um, which is Hastings, with all, it's got those green corridors coming into it. And I'm sure you could do things in, in, ta in towns and cities as, as well. And in order to understand exactly what was happening at Dixter, we produced a biodiversity heat map, you know, rightly or wrongly, because what that heat map does is that it, it, it identifies those areas, those things within your, your place that have the highest density of, of, of biodiversity. Okay, that doesn't mean that one place that has less is, is, is inferior, because just a few species in a corner maybe important species that you haven't got elsewhere you see so i think it's important to look at the whole picture of it but it was very interesting because we divided the garden into formal gardens and the and then which were the borders and then we invite we um, looked at the orchard area which is a meadow area the horse pond area which is a pond and a meadow the prairie which is a um, a late flowering meadow. We've got a new meadow, a newly formed meadow, plant fair meadow, the pasture. So most of that is grassed on. And then we've got farm, which has got the farm buildings. And Waits Wood is our, our, one of our main woodlands and four acre shore is a smaller woodland. So we divided it up into all those areas. And we looked at species that had conservation designations as well. So we thought the ancient woodlands would be quite rich, and they were. We thought the meadows would be rich. They were, they were extremely rich. We thought the pasture land would be rich. Yes, they were. They're, all of those areas were rich. And we thought that the garden would be the least rich of all those in, environments. But in, in fact, the garden was the richest part of the whole estate. That was the surprising thing. It was richer than all of those other bits of land that we've got around us. And this is just um, looking at information halfway through the through the. Um, the the um, survey and you know the, the, it wasn't because everybody's surveying in the garden they didn't want us to come into the garden we had to force them into the garden to survey they wanted to come, survey all the wildland around us the estate but if you look at it you know at this point when we had 676 species 271 were found in the formal gardens 240 were in the plant fair field you know and if you look at something like culiates which are bees and wasps 154 
in all areas, 91 species found in the formal gardens. You know, so formal gardens for aculeates, which are bees and wasps, for diptera, which are two-winged flies, for lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies, for hemiptera, which are true bugs, to odonata, which are dragonflies and damselflies, to parasitoid wasps. The formal gardens were the highest part of the whole estate. And if you look at the all species, the formal gardens were the highest of all those species. And if you look at the nationally scarce species, the formal gardens were were the highest. And you know that's incredible, isn't it? So that the garden is 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 protecting all those or as a host to all those all those extraordinary species. And so um uh Nectar and pollen habitats, herbaceous vegetation habitats, stem and thatch habitats, scrub and tree habitats, bare ground habitats, and dead wood post habitats were all highest in the formal gardens. So those species associated with those habitats were found, they found a nice niche for themselves within the formal gardens. So that's, again, so it shows what a diverse habitat the garden like Dixter can be. And if you look at this sort of, this is just looking at the insects of Dixter, 1,185 species in the whole of the estate, the whole of the estate. And if you look at the number count, 516 of them were in the garden. That's almost double the amount they were in the meadow areas, plant fair field uh, and, and the woodlands. So you can see how the garden supported a vast number of insects and, and there of all sorts of insects. So that was fascinating too, to look at that. So look, we thought this was going to be really quite amazing. And, you know, orchid rich meadows that they were going to be the richest. It's not, you know, that's the orchard, 259 species, 516 in the garden. So twice as much in the garden. And it was also very interesting because you think that orchid rich habitat is going to be very rich. But actually, this sort of scrappy habitat was as rich, if not richer, than, than the orchid-rich habitats. And what we do, you know, you know, as we this in this area around us, it's a pretty green area. Anytime we see a verge with an orchid on it, we put a protection flag on it. Okay, but nobody's protecting these sort of areas, which have got as many species as these sort of areas. So we have to have to sort of reset our mind to actually perhaps protect those mediocre inverted comma areas as, as well. You know, all of those habitats are important. But at Dixter, our success is down to this. The success is down to having wild plants rubbing shoulders. These are buttercups and cow parsley and moon daisies rubbing shoulders with the, the exotics that we garden with. Okay, so you've got the two acting together. The exotics prolong the seasons, give us variety. The wild habitats do their job of attracting all of those insects to, to, to us. Okay, so that was really important. Also important is that we don't cut down prematurely. We leave some vegetation up over winter. And that's really quite, quite interesting because to form a, you know, not only are, are the seed heads and stuff, so on being used by all the, the birds and so on, but actually the, the, the stems are, are home to all sorts of things that, that bury themselves in them. So that's habitat was very important, that habitat of detritus. We use a lot of umbrals. We use a lot of alliums. So that gives us um, landing pads and pollen and nectar for a wide range of insects as well. So the sort of plants we're using were very important. And as you saw earlier, every space is dynamic and has layer after layer after in it. As it's a, it's a very, it's a concentrated form of the landscape where vegetation comes one after another. So there's an incredibly long food source there at Dixter. And there's a diversity of habitats. You know, we've got porous buildings, you know, and ancient buildings with all sorts of nooks and crannies and cracks and so on for things to be in, to these extraordinary borders that are woodland edge. They've got trees and shrubs and perennials and annuals and they and soft cliff in the way that they're they're you know dug up on a regular basis. We've got paving which is open in, in the in the cracks so that things can sit um make themselves at home in the cracks in the paving the short grass is important as the long grass it shouldn't be all long grass that's a different habitat grows different plants uh, it bakes whereas this is a cooler habitat underneath it you see so so the short grass next to long grass there's shrubs and woodland edge and it goes into the countryside so it's, it's a diverse habitat 
and the food crops just there these things nest in the cracks in the walls and and so on and then when they fly out that the food what they feed on is just there it's just you know it's the perfect storm as we said it and and the ch vegetation changes but look at the terrace there with all those sort of cracks in between it's not cement it's cemented up so things can nest in there and then come out and feed on the plants that are there and it's an old building, you know, it's a 15th century building. So you've got, you're bound to have little cracks in the brickwork and so on. And we don't close those up because we just make sure um, the weather doesn't come into the building. We make sure the building doesn't deteriorate, but actually it's very porous, that building. And even if you had a new build, you know, the buildings can be still be porous by having these insect bricks and, and uh, you know, swift boxes and those sort of things that can be a part of your, your structure to invite biodiversity. So there's no reason that you don't need a 15th century building to do that. You can do it with modern buildings. And that, and I'm not saying go and drill holes in your walls. You know, that's not that's crazy to do that. And actually at Dexter, um, we use old fence, fence posts. We don't get rid of them. We we have, you know, dead wood standing on the edges. We have these areas where plants are allowed to decay as well. That's all outside of the garden. But that sort of that sort of material is very important for us. But we also have detritus. We're closed over the winter. So things are protected with the old leaves of other things as well. So that detritus is very important for things to lay their eggs on and so on. So again, another diverse habitat here. And we play around. We play around with creating these sort of stress wall habitats, as you can see here, you know, um, these all sorts of things like this. Um, stress grass habitats, we, we have habitat piles, we close off the drainage in certain areas as, as well. So, you know, we, we've got a diversity of, 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 of things there. And the meadows are cut on our sort of, you know, are randomly cut, but actually they have a, a system and, and some areas are cut four or five times a year. Some areas are quite tw twice a year. Some areas are cut once every three years and so on. So there's that mosaic structure within them as well. So here is a bit of meadow that's been cut and then it grows. The crocuses come up through it. And then it does that with the snake head fertilities and the orchids. And then it does that with the cow parsley and the gladiolus and those sort of things. And then it does that with the meadow sweet that takes over from it. And then it then goes brown like this. We wait for the seeds to fall and then we cut it again and the cycle starts all over again. OK, as you can see, there is that sort of mimicking that sort of mosaic system. So there's a whole range of activities at Dixter. Some areas are cut more regularly and rather than have red clover in those areas, we have white clover in those areas and, and lawn daisies and so on. So the vegetation changes as a result of us cutting it things differently. And that's so good for certain pollinators like the longhorn bee, which is important, that 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 loves the medics and those sort of semi semi shaded areas as, as well. So we delay the cutting of these medic areas just because of this rare bee that we have around around us. And then there's certain areas that we actually just rather than cut it with machinery, we put sheep on them and the sheep then take the vegetation down very slowly and leave the stems up so that things can nest in the stems as well. And then we play around with when we take the sheep off. So we may try and create this this, this sort of tussocky vegetation, which is great for biodiversity, or we may get the sheep to take the tussocky vegetation down a bit further. And then, but the resulting sward it's different from the other bits of meadow that we cut with machinery. So we're creating another habitat by using a different method of management of these areas. OK, so the vegetation is quite different with a little path cut, cut through it. So we play around with these areas. We allow certain areas of lawn to grow. This area had been cut as a lawn since 1921. We allowed it to grow. And look at all the all the flowers that came up and flowered within, within it. OK, if we look at the topiary lawn. That was a formal lawn and we then allowed it to grow and it started having or orchids self-sown on it, as you can see there. And before you know it, you know, the whole thing is full of buttercups and then the whole thing is full of orchids, as you can see there. That's taken several years, years to do that, but it was very it's fascinating. So the whole place is charming, but also it's dynamic. You know, it's got all those activities. It's got all of those things that you see there. And no wonder with all those activities, with all the flowers and all the different habitats, it's no wonder we have all of this. We have all the biodiversity. So gardens can play a real role in all of this. So ecologists in the UK have considered gardens and the design landscapes to be a part of the problem. This is very much a prejudice in the UK 
don't know what it's like in the USA, but but now are realizing that we can be part of the solution. And that's the great thing about the order at Dixter. Gardens, large or small in the countryside, urban or suburban, whether they're public or private, along with roadside verges, urban areas, brownfield sites, and so on, will add up to something effective. This, along with protecting the countryside and farming in a sensitive way, will make a huge difference, not just for biodiversity, but for mitigating climate change as well. So it's great, isn't it, that, that people like Laura Gatti are doing Bosco Verticale. It's great that they're rewilding at net, net. It's great that John Little is doing with his grass roof company, interesting things with bite shelters and so on. But these places that have got borders and plants, garden plants, can play an important role as, as well. Dixter's mosaic can be replicated in a village or a town or a, or a city. It's the same thing. And that's why we've been sort of pushing forward with our sort of green work in places like Hastings because we're taking this sort of this, the, the, the model of the greater green scheme that was done by Nigel Dunnett and, and Zach Tudor and just turning those grey streets into something like that with really sort of low um, low maintenance multi-layered public realm planting that traps microplastics traps slows down water and is great for biodiversity and it's great for people to walk and sit in and and and, and so on and the pandemic showed us that you know if we just allow certain areas to grow life would be you know the places would look so much more comfortable you know because look there were the red poppies along the car park in hastings and they flowered in the pandemic but then as soon as the pandemic was over they got sprayed off, you know, so, and who on earth is spraying those off? You know, who's paying for somebody to spray those off? Who's ordering somebody to spray those off using chemicals to do that? You know, seems mindless, doesn't it? But look, you know, forever people are creating these sort of landscapes, but there isn't a single crack or a vegetation or or, or tree in sight. There's some trees in the back, but they're alien, you know. They're, they're, I wonder what on earth the pigeons are eating there, you know, and, and, we have got the knowledge there, you know, we've got the ability, all that knowledge is there, it's just having the will to do it in these places, you know, because look at the pointing there, there's no vegetation going to colonise that for years and years and years and years, you know, nobody's gardening the cracks there, whereas if you look at those sort of older towns and cities around, around us, like Hastings, look at the, all the sort of the, the, the plants that are making use of tiny little cracks and those opportunities there, surely we can do something to actually make that greener in the way we build so that we build safe walls, but actually walls that invite the vegetation to come into it. You know, it just doesn't seem to be, you know, um, doesn't, it, it's not rocket science to do that. So you may, you know, you may think, well, we can't have a wall like Dexter, but why not? You know, can't have a seat like Dexter, but why not? Why not create that in, in a town and city? But knowledge is key so we can act, you know, so it's really quite important for us as a garden. You know, we didn't realize that the honeybees were a bad thing for us. And we were asked by the entomologist to take them away, to get, to give them to a distant, distant neighbor, because we had such rare and interesting solitary bees that needed protecting from, from the aggressive honeybees. OK, and that's why we now work very closely together with an entomologist, with an ecologist like Andy Phillips, so that everybody going through our gates, all the students, everybody who works for us is actually has that mind of their, their side of their brain open to them. You know, that's why it feels really great to have these students from North Carolina, from, from Japan and Germany and Scotland and, and France and Portugal and and UK and UK, you know, all those people in together working in a place that's highly beautiful, colourful. It's 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 it um really focuses on beauty, but it's good for wildlife as 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 well. And we can be creative with it. We can do stress habitats and grow grow giant fennels as as you know you see them on the walls of Constantinople yeah, and create these habitats that that are actually out of the garden and that are interesting and and give us a completely different feature as, as well so what makes Dixter relevant is uh, rich is relevant to any design landscape or any garden the mosaic system within Dixter can be replicated in any village town or city it just needs politicians ecologists town planners councils builders landscapers architects and landscape architects volunteer groups gardeners and private individuals to have the will to work together. You know, we as gardeners can make this happen. It's about bringing wildlife in at every opportunity. Gardens and gardeners can play their part and everyone will bring a different element. So it's really great that we're not 
just isolating ourselves, like gardeners here, ecologists here, architects there. Let's all work together and make this happen. It's just, and we need knowledge to, in order to do that. Okay, so with that, I want to say thank you for listening to me. And, and if you want to see the progress of Dixter, you can follow it on Great Dixter Official or on, on, on my Instagram as, as, as well. But it's been a, hopefully I've given you an insight into what's going on at Dixter. It's very, very exciting, all, all of that stuff that we're playing around with. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus, for such an inspiring presentation. This is exactly what we wanted to, to bring bring today just let folks know that even in their small little gardens they can have an impact on the biodiversity in our region so yes. this is perfect thank you and, so and we do we, have uh, yeah go ahead what well, i didn't say something but we're very we're very sensitive to the countryside outside of our gate outside of the garden gate we're really protective we even if we're reseeding areas we we'll use local provenance seeds and so on and so on but yes. within the garden we're just we we just play with all sorts of vegetation Excellent. Well, we do have a couple questions, so I'm going to um, yeah. read those to you. Um, first off, there was interest in your fertility program. Do you need to feed these gardens consider considerably to support this incredible growth? Um, what do you add and when? Okay, so um, in the old days, we used to add, we used to go around and put regularly fertilizer out of a bag this is way back in 1990 in the 1990s but it's a time came in 1994 95 when we said why are we doing this we don't need to do that we stopped that and we just did it with organic matter and it didn't make any difference the organic matter was 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 great so what we do now is that i would say that that's 99.9% of the the feeding is done with organic matter the only time we would add an Org organic fertilizer uh, something out of a bag is that if we've got an old shrub that we had to prune back hard and we just want to give it a boost we may put it give some chicken pellet on it or something like that but we we hardly use any any sort of supplementary fertilizer at all you know i, I think this year i haven't used any last year i i used it on three hydrangeas um and 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 also we're on clay soil and it's a rich soil, so we feel that as long as we can open it up with organic matter, um, we don't have to feed it, and and we don't always have to. We'll look at the soil, so we don't always put organic matter in. So our feeding regime has got less and less and less and less within the within the garden. Um, but in order to make that succeed, you need to have resilient plants. And you also use plants that actually are used to growing with each other. You know, a crocus is not going to sap the energy of a meadow root um, because they'll grow quite happily to each to each other. If we were on sand, you could go two ways. If we're on sandy soil, you either feed the living daylights out of it or you use plants that are completely adapted to sand and we would do the latter. We'd choose the plants that are completely adapted to those conditions rather than having to feed it in a, in a, in a way. So we're trying to work with nature, but we're sort of just... We're just tweaking it here and there. Okay. Um, what do you do about invasive plants, if anything? Um, well, we're very, it's, it's a different story with you. With, with us, we're really quite lucky in that we don't have so many invasive plants. Okay. And that's partly climatic. Um, because what happens with us is that uh, a lot of our native vegetation carries on growing in the grasslands, for instance, carries on growing over the winter, unless if we have a cold winter. And so there's no room for anything else to come in and squeeze. Them. I mean, like, for instance, if, if I went to the prairies um, in the middle of the winter and saw things that were green, I bet you they'd be invasive things rather than the winter brown grasses and so on. You'd have. Whereas here, everything is green. So there's less room for invasives to come in. That doesn't mean there aren't problems because rhododendron is ponticum is a problem. Well, we don't have that. Um, and I think things like Gunnera and Gladiolus Byzantinus and those sort of things are a problem in Ireland, but our climate where we are doesn't allow those things to flourish. So we don't have um, major issues with, with invasives here. We have major issues with some of the wildlife here because our badgers and our pheasants and so on, they come and eat the snakes and fertilities and so on. So, you know, we, uh, 
we try and live with that as much as we can, you know, because sure. we're part of the countryside and just sort yeah. of turn a blind eye eye to it. But <laughs> I, I think touch wood, you know, we don't we haven't got too many issues here. Okay. Well that's good. You're lucky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's to say it's not going to change, but it's, it's right. Uh, <laughs> well, in reference to your successional plantings, how do you choose which plants you layer in the same area? Do you look at competitiveness, root structure, other things? I think competitiveness more than anything. Okay. And okay. Timing. Because what uh, I think it's down to not only competitiveness in the roots, but it's competitiveness in that zone, all trying to get the light at the same time. So if you have something like a, I don't know, if you had something like a um, an aster, um, that's quite a vigorous growing aster. You can kill it by having a forget me not with it because the forget me not moves into that space a lot earlier than the aster so you have to find make sure that you have things that actually give each other space and grow at different times so that one can take over from a, from another rather than one competing with with, with another so um, it's it's this is our speciality we've been doing this for years and years and years and i've written books on it and so on about just getting the sort of compatible plants in together so that they share the same space without knocking each other out that's good and um, you obviously have an incredible staff working with you there, Fergus. Can you speak a little bit to how many gardeners you have on staff and how that all plays out through the seasons? Okay, so um, in the formal gardens, in the gardens with, with all the colorful plants, we've got four full-time gardeners. Okay, that's that's four. So that that includes, it's me and three others. And then we have, you know, a a two part-time people, one three days a week and the other one three days a week. So that gives us six. So in a, in a sense, we've got five gardeners for the whole the whole thing. So, it's, um, but we have four or five students on top of that. And we're highly regarded as being, you know, the number, you know, widely regarded as being the number one training place for flower gardeners. So we have a long waiting list of students wanting to come to us. And so we, we uh, but, but, you know, although it means that you've got many more hands on deck, we actually teach the students in such a way that it takes us longer to garden a bit of, bit of space. I mean, I could garden the whole garden with, with just three gardeners if we didn't have to teach quite easily. But because we really put a lot of energy in teaching, it takes a long time. Sure, absolutely. So about, about five full time is, is ample for us. Wow. It's amazing. Um, the last question is, everyone wants to know if you listen to your wife more often now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. She was with me just a minute ago, actually, before I, I, I switched on. She came, she came to, to see me. Yes, she does. She's a very clever lady. So, you know, I couldn't have done it with, without her. But she was just very interested. She's a scientist, you see. And so sure. she, the reason she... she um, pushed me down this route she said if you're going to stand up and be taken seriously in front of anybody you need the scientific facts there she said yeah. you can say oh we've got great crested newts and we're we're diverse and we've got this and we've got that for all until the cows come home unless if you've got the facts people like me are going to say prove it you know and so that's yeah. why you know that's why it was that <laughs> the right thing but if and it was for us it was fascinating because we thought that partly the reason we were doing it was that we wanted to protect the wild land around us from being built on and so on so we thought if we were bound to find lots of wild interesting things on there so nobody can build on it but you know the result was that the garden was far richer than everything else and we thought that the garden was actually being fed by the wild land around it but they said no actually you're you know you're so rich you'll feed probably you're an oasis feeding all of that desert around you you know which sure. is fascinating well Fergus during your presentation you mentioned stress habitats can yes. you talk a little bit more about the stress habitats sure sure and and you know I I could have this this talk could have been a four-hour talk you see but <laughs> I went but I just wanted to give you an overlay on it Sure. So, uh, stressed habitat is if you look at the grassland that's around us, 
the um, most of the grass areas around us, the meadow areas and pasture, that's all managed by by us, by humans. Otherwise, it'd go to climax vegetation. It it would go to scrub and then oaks, and eventually oak, uh, end up as an oak forest. And the only place where this doesn't happen, where you we, where you get permanent grassland, in in uh, in the south of England or even in the Midlands of in, in mid of England is where the grass is very stressed. The habitat is very stressed. So coastal areas, for instance, is too dry for trees to grow. So you get permanent grassland. So you don't have to mow it. So if you then take sods and you put it on just two inches of soil on top of a roof, a corrugated metal roof, there's you create a permanent grassland. You're mimicking what happens. You're mimicking coastal grassland, which isn't so tightly knit together, which means that, that, that it's very open. So solitary bees love nesting in there. So it's a stressed habitat, which doesn't mm -hmm. allow trees and blackberries and those sort of things to grow on it. It remains as grassland. They haven't been cut for seven, eight years. And it just creates a different habitat to the lush grass that we have around us growing in the, in the garden and in the countryside. Mm -hmm. So it just just gave us a different habitat. It's like having, you know, we're on clay soil, but it's like having a lump of sand sitting in the corner on a south facing slope. The mining bees absolutely love that because it's not surrounded. It's not full of vegetation. They can they, it heats up. They can burrow burrow into there. So it's just it's just. And, and years ago, I I said to my wife. I know she'd worked on green roofs with 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 um, a, a wonderful person called Dusty Gage, and I said to her. I'm going to create a green roof. And um, what shall we, what shall we, what shall I plant on the green, green roof? You know, being clever, thinking that she's going to say, oh, great. That's a great idea, darling. But she said to me, why do you want to plant anything? She said, you've got so many plants at Dixter. Why don't you leave it as bare soil? And I thought, well, that's strange, leaving it as bare soil, you know, this roof. Yeah. So we left it as bare soil. And the ecologist who came, the entomologist said, that's really interesting because such and such a bee, bees in there. And such. What made you leave it as good? And I made it sound as though it was my idea, but it obviously it wasn't, you know. But, but so, so, just, so I just thought, it, and because we're creative with it, we thought, well, we'll just stretch the habitats that we've, you know, we'll just play around. Yeah, sure. So, it's so fun. Just, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fun, really fun, fun, which has been fantastic, actually. So was your wife surprised by your findings of the audit, or did she just think that you were reinforcing what she thought would be the case? She was surprised. I mean, she knew okay. we had good stuff, but mm -hmm. the, the sheer numbers that, that came out of it, you know, we've got near enough half the UK species of bees in this garden, you know, out of the, we've got near enough now it's near enough, you know, half the UK species of spiders, although we're in the south of England, so you'd expect that. But just the just the sheer range of things that we were get, getting was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. but, so she was surprised by that. But also she was surprised by the effect that it's had, because, you know, people from the Royal Horticultural Society or the National Trust or for botanic gardens or quite influential gardens around have all started doing biodiversity audits. So she was, she was, you know, because, and it's sad in some way because it's, you know, people have been banging on about this for years and years and years and years and they haven't been listened to, but you take a, you know, a garden like Dixter to do it and suddenly it makes the newspapers and so on and so on and people start doing it. So, you feel sorry for the people who have been fighting for this sort of thing for for so long. But hey, but Amanda was very good about that. She said, at least it's happening. You know, just make sure mm -hmm. you're part of the process of making it happen. They're part of the process of making it happen as well. So are you. So it's all positive and going towards the right, going in the right yeah. direction. Excellent. Well, Fergus, thank you so much for joining us um, this morning in, in the States. Um, this was an absolutely inspiring presentation, and I hope to partner up with folks here in the States and do some biodiversity audits next year. We have a fabulous partner um, that we work with often in Nature Spark here in Northeast Ohio, and we're anxious to get out there and um, put this into action. So I thank you so much for being here today. Oh, Rennie, thank you so much for having me. Thanks yes. very much. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye right. now. Thanks, everybody.